guys, today we are going over biomes, ecosystems, and the food chain. So our I can statement is I can understand the concepts of biomes, ecosystems, and food chains. So what is a biome? Can you name them all? Go ahead and try. We're going to review each biome and then we're going to kind of talk about ones that are similar to each other. All right, so the tundra. The tundra is a frozen treeless biome in the far north near the poles um, or in the far, far south near the, the south pole. So there's very little rainfall. Um, there's no trees, small shrubs, um, and lichens, which is like a small green plant that grows on top of rock and um, hard ground. There's going to be um, polar bears, arctic foxes, yaks, any type of animal that has adaptations to live in the cold. Animal and plant life are both going to be very scarce in the tundra because of the harsh conditions. Taiga. The taiga is also called the coniferous forest, and it's located below the tundra, but still pretty far north. There's moderate rainfall, and temperatures can be um, very, very cold to mild. There's a lot of cone-bearing trees that do not lose their leaves, um, which means that the leaves are not falling on the soil and there's no decay. When there's no decay, that means that the soil is not going to be very fertile. So it's not going to be very good for, um, for a lot of growing um, of like crops or anything like that. Um, animals that you might find in the coniferous forest or the taiga are moose, rabbits, owls, and small rodents. The deciduous forest. The deciduous forest is also called the temperate forest, and this is where we live. Um, North Carolina and the, the region, the Piedmont region where you live, is mostly um, deciduous forest. We have four seasons and plenty of rainfall. The deciduous trees, um, the trees that you find here, are trees that lose their leaves. In autumn or in fall, the trees lose their leaves and then the leaves decay on the ground making the soil very fertile, which allows for many different types of plants. We have ferns, flowers, oak trees, birch trees, maple trees, um, all of which again lose their leaves in the fall. Some of the animals that you see in a deciduous forest are deer, squirrel, black bear, coyote, and many birds. The desert. The desert is located generally near the equator and it is a dry, sandy, treeless biome. A desert is treeless, like a tundra. The main difference is going to be the temperature and the landforms that you find there. There's little to no rainfall and extreme temperatures in the desert. Because there is no rainfall and not very much cloud cover, the temperature drops dramatically at night, and it also gets very, very hot during the day. Um, there's no trees in the desert, there's, you may find cactus or small shrubs. Um, animals that you might find in the desert are reptiles, like lizards, some birds, and camels. Life is scarce, animal and plant life is scarce because of the lack of rain. Again, like the tundra, the desert is a harsh con condition, there, there are harsh conditions for animal and plant life, so you're not gonna find a whole lot of that. Rainforest. Now, the rainforest is opposite of the tundra and the desert. You're going to find abundant plant and animal life in the rainforest. Found in the tropical regions near the equator, and it's going to be hot all year. There is an abundance of rainfall. That means lots and lots of rainfall. You're going to find tall, dense trees with large leaves. Um, there's going to be a lot of snakes frogs, monkeys, apes, um, over or about half of the world's plant and animal population live in the rainforest. This is where you're going to find most of our 
um, variations of plant and animal life um, on, on Earth is in the rainforest. The grasslands. There are two types of grasslands. We have the savanna or the prairie. Um, there is little to moderate rainfall. And in the savanna, you're going to have dry, grassy fields. Um, you're going to find the savanna um, on the African plains. And animals that you might find on the savanna are giraffes, zebras, cheetahs, lions, elephants. And on the prairie, um, a prairie is what you find in like the breadbasket of the United States, the um, Midwestern region, the central Midwestern region. Um, here, this is an example of a prairie. And a prairie is where you're going to find wheat and corn and oats. Um, the soil here is going to be pretty fertile and it's going to have slightly more rainfall than the savanna. Um, animals that you might find in this type of a grassland are buffalo, bison, prairie dogs, or field mice. Aquatic biomes. Remember, aquatic means water. Um, the ones that we just talked about were terrestrial, meaning land. So now we're moving into the aquatic biomes. We've got freshwater versus saltwater biomes, and then we have um, a couple that are considered brackish water, which is a combination of salt and fresh water. So freshwater biomes that we talked about this year are ponds, lakes, rivers, streams, and wetlands or marshes. Uh, ponds and lakes are going to be still water. It's not flowing water. Generally speaking, it's calm and there's not a whole lot of movement in the water. Rivers and streams are going to be your flowing water, your moving water. Um, wetlands and marshes you generally find near the coast. Um, a lot of um, wetlands could possibly be brackish water. Um, you may also have some um, movement of the tides on a wetland or a marsh that's close to the ocean where you're going to have that water that comes in with the tides and moves out with the tides. Um, and then we have our saltwater biomes, your oceans, your seas, and your coral reefs. And again, these biomes are going to be affected by the tides. The tide goes out and the tide comes in. Um, and you're going to have little uh, ecosystems called tide pools that are left behind in like a depression in the sand, um, which is a, an ecosystem in and of itself. And then we have our brackish water ecosystem, the estuary. Um, an estuary is going to be found where a river meets the ocean and you have that mix of fresh and salt water. Um, and we call that water brackish water. And that is found in an estuary. So animals that um, can adapt to living in both salt and fresh water are generally sound, found in an estuary. Food chains and food webs. So we have herbivores, carnivores, omnivores, producers, consumers, scavengers, and decomposers. So an herbivore is an animal that eats only plants, okay? A carnivore is going to be an animal that eats only meat. An omnivore eats both plants and meats, okay? A producer, producer starts with P. Producers produce their own food. All plants are producers. All plants are producers. Trees, flowers, clover, um, shrubs, um, vegetables. Those are all producers. They're able to produce their own food using photosynthesis and energy from the sun. Consumers. Consumers are anything, any organism that has to eat another organism to survive. Any organism that eats another to survive. Okay? A scavenger is going to be an organism that eats dead 
organisms. Eats dead organisms. Really, a scavenger is going to um, find a kill that a carnivore has um, made, and they're going to come over and like eat up all the leftovers. Then we have decomposers. Decomposers break down um, dead organisms. And the decomposers turn those dead organisms into usable energy that goes back into the soil and can go back into the food chain through um, the nutrients that producers use. So we've got primary, secondary, and tertiary consumers. So your, your first level, your primary consumers, are the ones that eat the producers. Your secondary consumers are animals that eat other animals. And your tertiary consumers are the ones at the top of the food chain, like a lion. So when a producer or a consumer dies, or a scavenger really, when a producer, consumer, or scavenger dies, the decomposers are the ones that break down those dead organisms and make their, their cells and their energy into reusable energy that goes back into the food chain. All right, so in this food chain, we have um, the flow of energy. The energy from the corn goes into the field mouse and the energy from the field mouse goes into the owl. So what happens then if um, a disease ravages all the field mice and the population of field mice decreases? Well, corn is going to increase because the field, mouse, the field mice are not there to eat it. And the population of owls is probably going to decrease unless they can find another food source. Um, same thing in this one here. We've got carrots, and the energy from the carrots goes into the rabbits. The energy from the rabbits goes into the fox. The, the energy from the fox goes into the mountain lion or lion here. And um, in this food chain, let's say that there is an overpopulation of rabbits. The fox might be happy because he's got more to eat, but the carrots the um, supply of carrots is going to go down because there are too many rabbits eating only one food source. Okay, and in our last one here, we've got grass that's eaten by the grasshopper, giving its energy to the grasshopper. Then the energy gives, it, or the grasshopper gives its energy to the frog. The frog gives its energy to the snake, and the snake gives its energy to the hawk. Now, what happens if our owl, our lion, or our hawk pass away? A decomposer is going to break down that dead animal and put its energy back into the food chain. So in an ocean, there's a food chain too. We have phytoplankton, which are these tiny little plant, this tiny little plant life. And they may be eaten by a crustacean, like a small shrimp, which is then eaten by a fish, which is then eaten by a dolphin, which is then eaten by a killer whale. So the energy from the phytoplankton goes into the shrimp, and the energy from the shrimp goes into the fish, energy from the fish goes into the dolphin, and energy from the dolphin goes into the killer whale. Now, a food web is an overlapping food chain because do you only eat one thing? No, I don't. Some animals are able to get their energy from a variety of different species. So we've got um, a variety of producers. Some energy goes into the grasshopper, some goes into the butterfly, um, and then the grasshopper is actually prey to multiple um, predators. Remember, prey is the animal that's getting eaten, and a predator is the one that is doing the attacking. Um, so a food web is going to be overlapping food chains. Now what happens if the population of frogs decreases. Well, the population of frogs decreases, then
then that might mean that the dragonflies and the free flies, they might increase, which is good for the thrush over here because then they have more food. However, the snake and the eagle are now going to have to find other sources of food, um, other sources of energy because the frog population has decreased. Therefore, the eagle and the snake population may also decrease. Um, the ocean also has food webs, overlapping food webs, and if there's a disruption in the food web, then we've got other animals that are going to have to either find a different food source or their population is going to decrease um, as well. And that's it for violence and food chain. Thank you.